So I want to tell you about some work that Doug did in, in really one, one paper. He wrote one paper about this, this subject in 1983. And, uh, and this, isn't, this isn't a paper of Doug's that everyone reads. He's written papers that everyone reads, but this isn't one of them. But I, I, am, I really love this paper. This really sparked a lot of ideas for me. And following the, the sort of ideas in that paper, I, I, think, I, think I've, I think there's doors in that paper that when you open them lead to real wonders. So I want to try and sell you on that and to tell you about this stuff. So here's the idea. There's something called a formal module. The first thing I'll do in this talk when I start using my slides is to actually define that thing for you. But what a formal module is, is it's a formal group law with some extra structure. And originally it was the number theorists that were encountering these things and using them. And I'll tell you what the number theorists did with them. They did some really nice things with these. But here's the thing about formal modules. They have a moduli stack, right? You guys uh, are probably used to seeing uh, the moduli stack of one-dimensional formal group laws. This is something that we deal with all the time. And there's also a moduli stack of one-dimensional formal A modules. And every formal A module has an underlying formal group law, so you get a map of stacks that classifies the underlying formal group law of the universal formal A module. What is A? Well, A could really be any commutative ring, but the, really, the, the ones that, that I'm really going to focos on today the most, and that Doug focused on the most, are these. Uh, I want to let, throughout this talk, I want to let A be, unless stated otherwise, I want to let A be the ring of integers in a finite extension of the rationals. In a finite extension, finite field extension, you know, of the rational numbers. So for example, you know, we could be doing things like uh, z adjoin root 2, right? Things like this, you know, things you see in your, uh, you know, at first year abstract algebra course, things like this. Um, that's what A is typically, typically going to be in this talk. Although for what I'm saying right now, A could be any commutative ring. There's a map of stacks here. This is going to induce a kind of restriction map in cohomology from the flat cohomology of the moduli stack of formal group laws to the flat cohomology of this moduli stack of formal A modules. And now I'm putting things in this sort of uh, stacky language, which I mostly aren't, am not going to do today. I'm mostly going to use the equivalent Hopf algebraic formulations for everything today, because that was the language that, that Doug used in his paper on the subject. And I think that's still the language that people understand better. If I want to rephrase this in terms of Hopf algebraids, here's, here's the statement I'd make. This flat cohomology. That's x in the category of mu star mu co-modules. Well, it's the thing that you're used to. It's the input for the adams novikov spectral sequence for the sphere, right? It's the E2 term for that. And what's this? Well, this thing is x in the category of co-modules over, well, Hauser-Winkel introduced this notation, L upper AB. Now, I'm going to tell you much more about this L upper AB. I'm going to tell you a lot about this Hopf algebra that classifies formal A modules. That's in the slides, which somehow I haven't even gotten to yet. But, uh, but, uh, but you, you, there's a classifying Hopf algebra to formal A modules, and you're just taking x in the category co-modules over that thing. And that's, that's the same as a flat co-homology of the moduli stack. There's a map here. There's a map here. And we care deeply about this, right? This is the input for a spectral sequence that computes the stable stems, and it, it does it quite efficiently, actually. And so you could say, look, could we use this map to detect things, right? Of course, this is notoriously hard to compute. But maybe some things here might be easier to compute, and we can make computations here and use them to detect interesting classes here. That, that was the idea. That was the idea. In some ways, that idea pans out, and in some ways, it doesn't. But you, there are some variations you can make on it that do pan out. And that's part of what I want to tell you today. OK, so finally, let me kind of sketch the circle of ideas that, that, that Ravenel kind of, uh, kind of illustrated in his paper on this subject. And uh, I'm going to sketch this circle of ideas, and then I'll tell you much more detail about them. But here's the circle of ideas. On the one hand, you can talk about cohomology of moduli of formal A modules. On the one hand, you can talk about this. And you can compute this. And by moduli, I mean, well, you could do these X groups. Or you could look at analogs of Lubin Tate space. But formal A modules, those are heavily studied by number theorists. And, uh, and those are moduli, you know, Lubin Tate spaces are moduli of deformations. So, you know, that, that's legit that I'm calling that a moduli of formal A modules. You could say cohomology, X groups over these things. That's one thing you can study. 
Um, you can study stable stems. You can study stable stems. And I'm going to put a squiggly line here to indicate that there's potentially some kind of relationship here. Or at least in 1983, it seemed that there was potentially some kind of relationship. And now we know that there is. There is. There's actually several relationships. And I'm going to tell you about what they are during this talk. And then there's a third subject. And the third subject is uh, entirely within the realm of number theory. And I'm going to resist telling you about uh, this sort of as much as I can, even though it's becoming one of my favorite things to talk about, really. I really think about this stuff all the time. I mean, this is a part of pure number theory. There's special values of L functions. Now, the number theorists, it turns out, are pretty good at making, at relating special values of L functions to certain kinds of cohomological calculations in the moduli of formal A modules. And so, if you can, if, if you can make sense of what the number theorists are doing and exploit this connection, and if you can establish these connections, and they're good enough, close enough connections, well, then you can express stable stems, or the orders of stable stems, in terms of these complicated rational numbers that are heavily studied in number theory. And that's the idea, right? So that's, that's the sketch. That's the roadmap. But now I want to tell you sort of details about all this. I want to fill in, fill in things here. So here's my section. So first, let me tell you about uh, pre-1983. 1983 is Ravenel's paper on the subject. So I'm going to tell you about some pre-Ravenel history of formal modules. Uh, so, bef bef you know, so this is all going to be how the number theorists were using formal modules. First, I should tell you what they are. What is a formal module? If A is a commutative ring and R is a commutative A algebra, then by a, uh, a one-dimensional formal A module, which is really an abbreviation, and the, the real name you should use when you're writing grant applications, for example, is formal group law over R with complex multiplication by A. The, the grant applications thing was a joke. But in any case, that's, that's the more uh, the, the weighty sounding name. But, uh, but in any case, formal A module is short for that. So what is that? That's a one-dimensional formal group law over R. R is just the coefficient ring. But the point is that coefficient ring needs to be an A algebra. It needs to have an action of A. And you ask that there be a ring homomorphism from A to the endomorphism ring of S. So that's natural, right? Formal A module should be a formal group law with an action of A. So that's, that's what this row is. It establishes an action of A on your formal group law. And the one compatibility you ask for is you ask that when you do row of an element in capital A, you see row of A of X. Well, what, what does that mean? Row of A is an endomorphism of F. So it's a formal power series of one variable. Let's call it variable X. You ask for that formal power series to be congruent to just AX modulo X squared. Right? So that's why I needed to ask for the coefficient ring R to be an A algebra. I needed to make sense of that AX there. You need, you need a coefficient to be an A algebra for that to be defined. All right, that's the definition. Now, it turns out that everything you're used to doing for formal group laws, pretty nearly everything you're used to doing for formal group laws, has some kind of decent generalization for formal modules. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you some examples here. Now, first of all, formal group laws are a special case of formal modules. A formal Z module is a formal group law. A formal module over the P addicts, well, that's the same as a formal group law over a commutative algebra over the P addicts. Um, but for rings other than localizations or completions of the integers, the theory is much richer and more interesting. OK, so, so uh, let me tell you about some kinds of things that you're used to for formal groups that work perfectly well for formal modules. If your ring A is a discrete valuation ring with a finite residue field, so not everyone loves to, loves, loves to see the letters DVR and, and like is immediately happy with that, right? So what are some DVRs? The p-local integers, p-adic integers. Or, you know, you could take uh, the ring of integers in any finite extension of, of the p of the, the addicts, QP. That's a good example. And actually, that's the kind of example I'm going to do a lot of today. Uh, so, you know, well, so that would be something like, you know, maybe like ZP adjoined root 2, things, things like that. Those are DVRs, um, discrete valuation rings. So, if A is a DVR with finite residue field, like either of these, then any formal A module um, has a notion of A height. And it's, it's just what you're used to. You write, down, uh, you write down the pi series. Instead of, right, for ordinary p height, you write down the p series of the formal group law. Well, when you got a formal A module over a DVR, instead of the p series, you write down the pi series, where pi is a uniformizer. Uniformizer just means generated of the maximal ideal, right? So saying that pi is a uniformizer means that uh, it generates the maximal ideal of your DVR, that's all. So instead of the P series, you use the Pi series. You write down essentially the same definition of P height, except you replace the power of P in uh, you know, X to the P to the H that you normally see in P height. You replace it with the cardinality of the residue field, A mod Pi. 
Okay, so pretty reasonable. Looks like what you're used to. And when A is the P addicts or the P local integers, this, this is just the usual notion of P height that you're used to. Now here's the, here's the, uh, the sort of first remarkable thing about this notion of A height for a formal A module. If A is the ring of integers in a finite extension of the P addicts, right? Something like this. This is the ring of integers in a quadratic extension of the, of the P addicts. Then uh, the A height, first of all, the A height of a formal module is an integer. And it's also equal to the P height of the underlying formal group law times the degree of the field extension. So here's what that means. If you have a formal group law F, and you're asking yourself, is it possible that this is the underlying formal group law of some formal ZP adjoined root 2 module? Well, that's only even possible if your formal group law has even height, right? Because this is the ring of integers, the extension QP adjoined root 2 over QP, and the degree of that extension is 2, right? So, so there's some real restrictions on what can be a formal module that are just established by this, this simple relationship. And this, this, this leads to much more interesting things than you might guess. All right, now let me tell you how number theorists use this stuff. So first of all, Lubin and Tate, did I put a date on this? I don't think I did, that's, that's foolish. I think this was about 1960 that they proved this, although maybe someone in the audience knows more specifically. Uh, Lubin and Tate proved if you choose a formal A module, F, uh, over A itself, right? Let your coefficient ring be A itself. And if that formal A module has A height 1, well, okay, so its underlying formal group law, may, it's, it's going to have P height greater than 1. Its P height is going to be the degree of the field extension, uh, the degree of the field extension K over Q, right? Uh, K over QP. But, uh, but, but you ask for your formal A module to have A height 1, then, um, then the, the underlying formal group law of your formal module, it will converge for, uh, it, it actually converges. That formal power series in two generators, it actually converges as long as what you plug into the formal power series is in the maximal ideal in the completion of the ring of integers of the algebraic closure of K. So you get an honest to God group structure on that maximal ideal. Let T, if you let T be the set of torsion elements in that group, then that set T, that's exactly all the stuff in K bar, the algebraic closure, that you need to adjoin to K in order to get the maximal totally ramified abelian extension of K. So what you're supposed to think of here, now when I tell you something about formal modules that I'm not sure you're gonna care about at all, right? Uh, like you didn't come here to hear a talk about formal modules, you, you came here to celebrate Doug's birthday. So I'm gonna try to convince you that uh, this formal module stuff is really, really worthwhile. So, uh, so I'm gonna try and show you the classical theorem that e all these things generalize. Now the classical theorem here is, uh, well, for one thing, there's a Kronecker-Weber theorem, right? The, the composite of all the abelian extensions of Q is the same thing you get when you adjoin all the roots of unity to Q, right? That's a famous one. And there's a, there's, in the 1920s, uh, I guess Takagi, I think, is the one that finished the proof of this one. Um, in the 1920s, there's a sort of quadratic uh, extension of Kronecker-Weber. If you have a quadratic imaginary extension of Q, in order to get the composite of all the abelian extensions of the quadratic imaginary extension, you choose a, a, an elliptic curve uh, uh, over the rationals, but which has complex multiplication by the ring of integers in that extension. And then uh, you take K, adjoin the J invariant of the elliptic curve, and adjoin the values of the Weber function on all the torsion points of the. I'm not going to get into that. The point is it's a quadratic imaginary version of Kronecker Weber. So, okay, great. Now, people had to work very hard on that, and we don't, there is no cubic version of this yet. That's really global, though, you notice. That's really about the, uh, the abelian closure of a global field, Q, or an extension of Q. What Lubin and Tate did is they did uh, the, the p-adic version, right? If you have any finite extension of QP, Lubin and Tate tell you what the abelian totally ramified closure of that thing is without any restrictions on whether it's imaginary or it's degree or anything like this. So very strong theorem, but it's all p, it's all p-adic. Um, and it uses formal modules of, of, of height one, of a height one. Okay, great, so that's nice. Now let me tell you a bit about how the number theorists have tried to take this further. It led to some of the same things that we in homotopy theory use, uh, like Lubin-Tate spaces uh, classifying deformations of formal groups of height larger than one. Well, the number theorists have been studying those things too. So let me tell you kind of what, been, what they've been doing with them, because they really use that stuff in the formal modules case. Um, understanding the abelian closure of K, the way that Lubin and Tate let you do, that amounts to understanding the one-dimensional representations of the absolute Galois group, you know, the Galois group of K bar over K, because the one-dimensional representations of the, of the absolute Galois group, those are the ones that factor through the abelianization map. And when you abelianize 
the Galois group of K bar over K. That's, that's just the Galois group of K ab over K. So Lubin and Tate, what, one way of seeing this kind of like Langlands flavored way of seeing what Lubin and Tate did is they really told us what all the one dimensional representations of the absolute Galois groups of p adic number fields are. And then you might say, can we take this further? One way to take this further would be, can we maybe understand the n-dimensional irreducible representations of the absolute Galois group of a, p of a p adic number field? And maybe we expect those to have something to do with height n, a height n formal a modules. And indeed, uh, Drinfeld is the first one to sort of make that precise. Uh, he considered, now this, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to get into the details of this. If you're curious about this, I'm happy to talk afterward. But this, this is a real tangent for the sake of this talk today. But, but let me say it briefly. Um, Drinfeld uh, constructs uh, the, the deformation space of an A-height N formal A module with a Drinfeld uh, level P to the M structure for each M. It let M go to infinity. You, you, get, this, you get this great space. And um, what, what do I mean by Jacques Langlands correspondences? Well, I tell you a bit about that here. Now, now this is something Drinfeld expected when he first laid this theory out in the 70s. It was Faultings that made good on this, uh, sort of in two papers in 94 and 2002. So if L is a prime distinct from P, um, you take the l adic rational italco homology of this space constructed by Drinfeld, and this thing splits as a representation, uh, as an l adic you know, representation of, of these two groups. Now, OK, why am I talking about these groups? GL and of A, you know about general linear groups. You know that they matter for many things. Um, what is that thing there next to it, that O sub D 1 over N comma K cross? Well, look, let me explain what that is. Let me explain bit by bit. You take the invariant 1 over N division algebra with center K, right? So that's a rank N squared division algebra with center K. You take its maximal order, you know, maximal compact subring, and you take its group of units. Now, there's a case in which this is extremely familiar. If K is the, is the p adic uh, rationals, this is the automorphism group of a height n formal group law over, uh, I guess I want to say fp to the n is probably the safe way to do it. Um, yeah, this, so this is the famous uh, uh, Morava stabilizer group. You know, we've been talking about this for, for well, longer than I've been alive, actually. Um, so. Um, so wonderful, great. And some of the people in this room aren't the people that got us talking about this, I guess. And uh, OK, great. So, so, so this thing these number theorists care about, uh, the Morava stabilizer groups are a special case. And it turns out that the irreducible representations of that group are in bijection with super hospital representations of GLNA. And this, this bijection is realized in the l uh etal cohomology of these, these Drinfeld things. So um, OK, that's a real tangent. I'm going to shut up about it. Um, yeah, I'm going to shut up about it and keep going. Uh, but, but in any case, I did want to, to show you this so you, you get an idea that people have extended this, uh, this uh, Lubin-Tate theory for formal modules to higher height formal A modules, higher than height 1, and really proven some nice things. But that's all still, still number theory. So now let me, let, me, let me go back a bit. Let me talk about things that are going to build up toward more topology, things closer to the Novikov E2 term. Let me tell you a bit about moduli of formal modules so that I can make sense of their cohomology. So formal, formal modules have a really clean uh, moduli theory that's very much what, like what you're used to from formal group laws. For every commutative ring A, there's a really easy formal argument that there is a classifying Hopf algebra of formal A modules and their strict isomorphisms, just like what you're used to for you know, MU star, MU star, MU. It's a very easy formal argument that, uh, that such a thing should exist. And when A is the integers, it's the usual thing you're used to, MU star, MU star, MU. Okay. So, it's also very easy to show that the classifying ring of uh, strict isos of formal A modules is isomorphic to the classifying ring of formal A modules adjoined countably many infinitely polynomial generators. That's, that's exactly what you're used to from MU, right? You're very used to this isomorphism. You're very used to this isomorphism. You have the same isomorphism for formal modules. The trouble is that the classifying ring for formal modules may be a little weird. Now, you know the classical one, Lazard in 1955, proved that the classifying ring of formal groups is, you know, the famous Lazard ring. You've used it many times. It's isomorphic to, to mu star. Um, Drinfeld in 74 proved that if A is a field or if A is the ring of integers in a local non-Archimedean field, like, a, like the ring of integers in a finite extension of the p-adic rationals, like this, for example. That's a great example. ZP adjoining root 2, or ZP itself. 
um, then uh, this classifying ring for formal modules, it's still polynomial and countably many variables. It still has that form. Hauser-Winkle in 76 proved the same thing is true if A is a Dedekind domain of class number one. So, okay, so Dedekind domain, uh, some of your favorite examples of Dedekind domains uh, <coughs> um, probably ought to be the rings of integers and extensions of Q. So, for example, I could take Q adjoined to root two. So in other words, that's a global version of what Drinfeld did. Drinfeld was talking about, uh, you know, p-adic number rings. Hauser-Winkel's theorem is, is really about global things, global number rings. But he has a class number restriction. Now, later on, this is a historical. This is out of sort of chronological order. Uh, you know, I should talk about the 80s before the, the 2000s. But, but there's an, there's a, this problem is kind of done for number rings now. But that's, that's out of order. But, in any case, uh, you always get a symmetric algebra on a projective module, but it's not necessarily a polynomial algebra. So that's another story. There's no other known cases where this Lazard ring has been computed. Okay, all right. Um, one thing that we're saying here, if you have a ring map from A to B, um, the induced map of Lazard rings, it usually does something far weirder than just sending the nice polynomial generators for LA to the nice polynomial generators for, for, for LB. It, it typically does something much weirder, and that allows room to get a really interesting map here. Okay, um, so I want to show you an example of that. I think, it's not, I think it's not on this slide. Yeah, it's on the next slide. Okay, so I'm gonna show you an example of that map uh, here at the bottom. I'm gonna show you an example of that in a moment. We all know and love p-typicality. That's something you're used to. Formal A modules have an analog of p-typicality. There's a notion of a-typicality. It's what you expect. Uh, the logarithm of the, of the formal module has a particular nice form. Um, so there's not really any surprise there. It's easy to show that uh, just the same way that BP star, BP star BP is a classifying Hopf algebraoid for p-typical formal group laws, it's real easy to show that there's a classifying Hopf algebraoid for formal A modules, uh, for, for uh, atypical formal A modules. And the special case where A is the p-local integers, that recovers, that recovers just that recovers just, uh, just you know, what you're used to, BP star BP. Um, now, um, all these L's, B's, V's, and T's, I didn't make this up. I'm using Hauswinkel's notation, which, so it's standard. I'm sorry if the alphabet soup is throwing you off. Uh, it, it is standard notation. Um, now, okay, great. So, uh, so as long as A, what is A here? A is a discrete valuation ring with finite residue field, like this, for example. Um, under that assumption, you have a classifying Hopf algebraoid for atypical formal A modules, and it has a nice form. V upper A is polynomial. Uh, v upper AT is, is polynomial over V upper A. It looks just like BP star BP. But the thing is, the map from BP star to V upper A usually does something fairly weird. Let me tell you what it does. Um, uh, let me tell you what it does in the case of a quadratic field extension. Now, I'm going to use Hauser-Winkel's generators, not Iraqis. Um, so, uh, let's see. So if your extension is unramified, you know, like if I take QP and adjoin a P squared minus first root of unity, that's, this, that's in fact the only example of an unramified quadratic extension of QP. Well, then the map from BP star to this V upper A, well, it just, it just throws out the, uh, the odd generators and cuts the, the degree in half of the, the even one. So that's easy enough. That's not complicated. But what's interesting is what happens when the field extension is ramified. Uh, then, um, well, you can see what happens. V1 goes to P over a uniformizer uh, for, your, for A times V1 upper A. So, for example, what about this one here? This is a nice example. Uh, root 2 is a uniformizer. In fact, let me put a 2 there. Now, root 2 is a uniformizer for that, uh, for that DVR. So then V1 goes to 2 over root 2 times V1A. Oh, okay, so that's root 2 of V1A. Well, that's fine, but you notice that when you reduce this to the residue field, right, when you mod up by the maximal ideal here, which is generated by root 2, you notice that's 0. That's 0 mod uh, the maximal ideal. So if you're looking for a map induced on sort of Morava K theories, you don't have an interesting map going from K1 star to a sort of formal A module version of K1 star. The map would be 0. Instead, if you want a map that's non-zero on sort of Morava K-theory-like things, but going from formal groups, the classical picture, to formal modules, it shifts height. You notice this? Uh, if you're, uh, it's, yeah, it has to shift height, because you can read the slide and see why. If you look at where V2 goes to, 
V2 goes to something, there's a formula I worked out that's written up there. Yeah, you can see what it is at the top. Um, there's this formula, but you notice when you reduce that module of the maximal ideal for quadratic extension, the only thing that's non-zero is P over uniformizer squared. So, you know, in this case, that's 2 over root 2 squared. V, well, you know what that is. That's V1A. Well, <laughs> look at this. So the natural thing, if you want a non-zero, if you want a non-zero map, oh, and there's a power in there, isn't there? It's, uh, yeah, it's the P plus first power. So the natural thing here, if you want a non-zero map on Morava K-theory-like rings, it shifts height. In fact, it halves height because we started with a quadratic extension. That's what's going on, really. Um, you get a map from K2 star to the formal A module K of 1 star. So that's what's going to halves height because we started with a quadratic extension. If we started with a degree D extension, then the natural map on, on Morava K-theory-like rings really, uh, really divides all the heights by D. And then it does some complicated things as well. Um, okay, great. So, okay, so that's something about the moduli of formal modules. Uh, on each, for each particular A, the moduli of formal A modules is very understandable, but the map that's induced by, you know, uh, by forgetting the formal group laws, it's a little bit complicated. So let me get to Ravenel's conjecture. Um, so still assuming that A is a DVR with finite residue field, every, you, you have a atypicalization, the same way that you do for, you know, you can p-typicalize a formal group law. So this, this is enough to show you that, uh, that the classifying Hopf algebra for atypical formal group laws, it's a, it's a, it's a Hopf algebra deformation retract to the bigger thing. It's, it's just the familiar fact, generalization of the familiar fact that when you uh, p-localize the mu Hopf algebra, well, you're the same X groups as uh, the BP Hopf algebra. So it's what you're used to. Now in 83, in Ravenel's paper on the subject, he lays out sort of the, the bulk of the main uh, machinery from the Green Book, he lays out formal module generalizations. There's a chromatic spectral sequence, there's, there's Bockstein spectral sequences, there's a change of rings isomorphism. So this gives you, you know, this is the familiar process, right? You compute the cohomology of a Morava stabilizer group with mod p coefficients. You run Bockstein spectral sequences to build up either the chromatic spectral sequence E1 term or cohomology with Lubin take coefficients if you want to run the Devonauts Hopkins spectral sequence. Uh, and if you're building up the chromatic spectral sequence, you run that, that takes you to the Novikov E2 term. Now the point is there's formal module generalizations of all this, but the input for the process, instead of the cohomology of a Morava stabilizer group, it's a generalization. It's the cohomology of the automorphism group of a formal, formal A module instead, a Honda-like formal A module. Now, Ravenel made some conjectures about how this would look when you start running this machinery. And uh, these conjectures are pretty much resolved now, but let me tell you how they got resolved and how the history went. So first, he made his local-global conjecture. And this is, this is sort of a, a local-to-global thing. It's saying that um, if you're interested in the, the global x, uh, x over you know, the classifying Hopf algebra of, of, uh, of formal A modules where A is a uh, uh, the ring of integers in a finite extension of Q, so global, not p-adic, then when you take the, the X groups and you localize them at a maximal ideal M, you get the same thing as if you had just computed X over the, you know, the, 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 the localized Hopf algebra. So um, this is just the familiar fact that the BP Novikov E2 is the p-localization of the, the, the MU Novikov E2. So not a surprise. Um, and uh, this turned out to be, this was the first of Ravenel's conjectures on the subject to get, uh, to get solved. In fact, uh, Doug's student, Austin Perlman, who I, th I think Doug was your third student, is that right? I'm sorry, Ra uh, Austin was your third student? Okay, yeah, Austin was Doug's third student. Uh, Austin uh, Perlman uh, solved this one already in 83 in time for, for Doug to mention that this, this had been solved before the paper went to press. Um, and so this was written up in Perlman's 1986 doctoral thesis. Uh, now, this, is, this stuff is obscure because uh, Perlman, I, I guess, you know, got sick and, and passed away very early in his career before any of his work was ever published. So, it's, so the only way to get this is to use interlibrary alone and get it from the University of Washington Library. So it's not that easy to, to, to get your hands on this. Um, but uh, let's see. Um, in any case, this first one was handled by Austin Perlman. Um, the next conjecture that, uh, that Doug made on the subject was uh, what, what he called the local conjecture. And this conjecture is that if you compute the analog of the formal A module analog of the, the, the BP Novikov one line, you should get a description that resembles what you're used to from the, from the alpha family. You should get a, 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 a description that resembles 
what you're used to when you compute uh, x1 over bp star bp. That was the idea. Generalize, generalize this familiar, this familiar thing to something that applies to formal A modules. And he made a specific conjecture here. What you get should be A modulo, a certain ideal which he gave a certain description of. And um, when A is the integers, this is, uh, actually, when A is the p-adic integers, this is what you're used to um, from the BP Novikov one line. Okay, the local conjecture, uh, in Ravenel's original paper, he proved it as long as the ramification degree of his field extension was less than p minus one. So for extensions that weren't too ramified, he, he proved it. A few years later, Keith Johnson, in 1987, uh, he extended this. He, he proved that the local conjecture is true uh, as long as A doesn't con contain a primitive p thread of unity, or it's also, okay, he, proof also works as long as E over P minus one isn't the power of P. Okay, fine, so that's many cases. Um, it's still open in other cases, and actually uh, Keith Johnson found that the local conjecture was actually not true in a few cases. Uh, Doug's original statement, uh, the, the, the computation he expected to see, the computation didn't play out in exactly that same way uh, when, uh, when your, uh, when your when A does contain a primitive p thread of unity. Um, and there's a little bit there about what happens. But uh, so this, this is really sort of still open uh, in the other cases. Okay? Then there's the global conjecture. Um, now Ravenel's statement of the global conjecture was a bit open-ended. Uh, you can see the statement here. For global A, this X group, now here's what that X group is, right? X over A, now this is really just shorthand for X in the category of VAT co-modules. So he expected this X group to come out to be A mod JMA, where JMA is up to small, some small factor, the ideal generated by, and you can read what it says on the slide. Now here's a good question. Um, what does this mean? What does this mean? It, so in order to make sense of this, we, let's talk a bit about Adam's numbers. I, I think if you try to make this statement precise without knowing about Adam's numbers, I, I think it's, it's, it's a mystifying statement. Uh, but in context, it makes sense. And it's, it's because, well, it's because uh, we know about Adam's numbers. So let's talk about Adam's numbers for a second. Okay, so these came out of uh, Adam's uh, work. This, this, I, I guess this uh, came from uh, image of J of X2. So this is Adam's uh, 1963 paper um, on J of X, the, the image of J. Um, so let's talk about these for a second. The kth Adam's number is the GCD of all numbers of the form a to the n times a to the k minus 1 for n sufficiently large. Now, the first time you see this, it seems strange that this even exists, but it does. So if k is 2, take a look at this. Well, all right, this is easy. You know, that's, that's an easy bit of arithmetic. Um, that's also an easy bit of arithmetic. Well, OK, actually, all this is easy arithmetic. But here's what you notice about these, these little computations. You notice that if this number capital N is very large at all, each of these, in each case, the number you're getting is divisible by 24. And 24 is also the largest number that has that property. So the second Adam's number is 24. Now, it turns out these things actually always exist. Adam says that he, uh, Eldon Dyer, uh, worked, worked out a proof of that and showed it to Adams, and he thanks Eldon in that paper. Um, so, uh, okay, and then so the, the reason that Frank Adams was thinking about these things in 1963 is that he was getting these numbers when he computed uh, MJ, when he computed the orders of the groups in the image of J in degrees congruent to 3 mod 4, uh, up to a factor of 2, actually. So, um, so put another way, when you compute the Novikov 1 line, the classical Novikov 1 line, you always get Z modulo, one of the Adams numbers, up to a factor of 2. So that's nice. Doug's global conjecture was... A generalization of this. The expectation was that if A isn't the integers, but maybe it's something like, you know, Z adjoined root 2, for example, what would you expect to get? You'd expect to get on the formal A module analog of the Novikov one line, you'd expect to get A modulo something like an Adams number, right? So, uh, and this, but the only case of this that was actually known uh, was the, the base case for A is the integers, and that was really, uh, that was really, uh, um, you know, that was really due to Adams' uh, J of X paper. Okay, so um, let's try and make this statement more precise, though. So now here's the trouble. Here's the trouble. Um, it, not every ring out there, not every ring of integers in an extension of Q is a principal ideal domain, right? And so it might be that when you try and make sense of sort of all the numbers with this Adams number like divisibility condition back here, it might be that when you try and make sense of all these numbers and talk about the ideal that, that they all live in, maybe it's not principal. So you have to, to be careful about this. So let me tell you how to be careful about it. Um, 
if A is a commutative ring and M is a positive integer, let me say that an ideal in A is M congruing if for every element in A there's a natural number N such that A to the N times A to the M minus 1 is in that ideal. Okay, so that means that if A is Z, you know, the, the base case where capital A is Z, then um, the M congruing, uh, the, the minimal M congruing ideal in Z is the ideal generated by the nth atoms number. That's the idea here, the idea. Now, Rabinow's global conjecture seem to be saying that, well, that this X group, this, this sort of, uh, this sort of uh, one line in the uh, formal A modulo Novikov spectral sequence, it ought to be A modulo some M congruing ideal. But which one? You sort of need a universal one to make this precise. Okay, so here's a, very, here's a sort of silly, easy technical definition that I'm going to speed past because it doesn't really matter. Um, um, here's, so here's a theorem that you use to make Rabinow's global conjecture precise. Uh, every Dedekind domain, which is Minkowski, and another, so it, Minkowski just means the residue fields are all finite, and uh, for any integer n, there's only finitely many residue fields of, uh, of order less than n. So it's a, it's, a, it's a silly, easy condition. Number rings satisfy this property. Uh, then A always contains a unique minimal n congruing ideal. So that's what you can use to make the global conjecture precise. You can ask that uh, you can ask that this sort of Novikov one line for formal A modules. You can ask that it looks like in each degree A modulo the minimal M congruent ideal times some small factor. Okay, that's a strong form. A weak form would be uh, a weak form would be when, you, when you're making precise what Rabinow meant by up to a small factor. Well, maybe you want to interpret that to mean you're allowed to localize at some number. So that would be sort of a weaker form. So here's two forms of the conjecture. Okay, now. Um, you can use Perlman's proof of the, local, the, of the local global conjecture together with the cases of the, of the local conjecture that Johnson proved, and a bit more. You, you, need a, you need a way to sort of local to global, not just the X groups, but also these n congruent ideals. So you need a Hasse principle for those. It, that's, that's, that's something that's done, so that's good. Um, and a, a, little bit, a little bit of computation. And then you get that this weak form of the global conjecture is true, uh, where the correcting factor C is the product of all the primes, such that some prime of k over p has ramification degree equal to p minus 1 times the power of p. So this is some factor of the discriminant of your, of your number ring. Um, so let me just tell you some cases in which that's just 1, because that's the nicest case, where the correcting factor is 1. You don't need to correct for anything at all. Um, if you have an extension of q, in, uh, which is Galois and of odd prime order and 2 ramifies, the correcting factor is 1. It's, you just work out what this silly thing is with the correcting factor. You do a little computation, and it is 1. A, a non-abelian example that's nice, the splitting field of this little polynomial over Q. That's non-abelian, the Galois group's symmetric group on four letters. And uh, anyway, you can see I wrote out here the primes that ramify and the, 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 the degrees and blah, blah, blah. It's, it's easy to show the correcting factor is one in that case. So for, 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 for that field, uh, for that splitting field, the, uh, the global conjecture is true both in the weak and strong forms. And the correcting factor is trivial. It's just one. It's, so, it's, so the global conjecture is true on the nose in that case. So we have some cases of the global conjecture. They're, they're, you know, so those are done. So that's the state of Ravenel's conjectures on, this, on, the, the, on formal modules. He made these three conjectures. But he did more than that. He asked some questions in this paper about the relationship of cohomology of moduli of formal modules to topology and about the relationship of cohomology of, of, of uh, moduli of formal modules to, to, to number theoretic things, to special values. He asked some questions about these. And, and he didn't state them as conjectures, but just as questions. And we have some answers to these, too. So let me talk about these. Uh, so now, um, maybe, maybe you should wake up. Because <laughs> you know, I've been talking about just pure algebra this whole time. And those of you that just really, really want to see topology and not just algebra, well, now I'm going to tell you about some, some, uh, some connections to topology. So um, Ravenel asked this question um, in his paper on the subject. Does, does there exist some spectrum, S sub A, whose MU homology is this classifying ring LA, this Lazard ring for formal A modules, does that exist? Uh, because if it does, then the X groups that you compute, uh, do I have them still? Yeah, right here. If it does, then this X group, this would be the E2 term, uh, by an easy change of rings argument, this would be the E2 term of a, uh, of a Novikov spectral sequence computing the homotopy groups of that algebraic extension of the sphere spectrum. And that's what in the literature, in, in the, the, there's been a few papers written about this over the years, and I'll tell you about them. Uh, in that literature, people have called these, 
these things that maybe existed and maybe didn't. People have called these algebraic extensions of the sphere spectrum. Okay, so the question is, do they exist? Do they exist? That will give you one kind of topological interpretation here. The answer turns out to be no, they don't exist. But there's a different kind of topological interpretation of what we're doing, and I'll tell you about it. Perlman, in his thesis in 1986, he showed that, he showed that, well, he couldn't show that there's a spectrum whose BP homology is that Lazard ring, but he could show that there is a BP module spectrum whose homotopy is the atypical Lazard ring as BP star modules. Uh, and he did a totally ramified case, and he did an appropriate adjustment of it in the unramified case. So, okay, great. Um, Perlman's proof is, is, is it's, a really clever, uh, it's a really clever sort of uh, kind of infinitary vast Sullivan argument. It's, it's really, it's, I've never seen anything quite like it. When EKMM came out, uh, you, you know this Elmendorf, Cridge, May, Mandel, uh, they have a chapter in there where they, they do something that's, that, that almost makes Bass Sullivan theory almost, almost obsolete. It's such a much kind of easier way to produce these ring spectra, which are uh, BP module spectra. But, uh, but, but Perlman's argument is actually a really different kind of Bass Sullivan construction, where he, he handles infinitely many copies of BP at once. It is not actually rendered obsolete by EKMM. And Peter May was surprised by this when I told him. <laughs> but in any case, it's, it's a very clever argument. Uh, so, um, Let's see, and you have to track down Perlman's thesis using interlibrary loans to, to, to read this, but it's worth doing. Um, so in 2006, uh, Tyler Lawson showed some, something, uh, he had a negative result. He showed that, uh, he showed that there is no, um, no global, uh, for a global extension of, uh, of the rationals, right? A global extension of, in other words, an extension of Q, not of QP. There's no E infinity ring spectrum whose Hoff algebroid realizes the classifying Hoff algebroid of formal A modules, okay. So that's fine. And, uh, and then sort of the last nail in the coffin is, uh, um, but you know, this doesn't directly answer Doug's question because Doug was really just asking for E star to be isomorphic to LA as BP star modules, not for uh, isomorphism of Hopf algebraids. But it turns out that you can't do that weaker thing either. Uh, you can't get, uh, um, if the BP homology of a spectrum can be given the structure of a, of, a, of a module over this Lazard ring for, for atypical formal A modules in any way at all, that implies a spectrum as an extension of a rational spectrum by a dissonant spectrum. So in particular, there aren't any non-trivial non p-local algebraic extensions of the sphere spectrum. There's the base case, which is just the sphere spectrum, um, and that's it. And then there's no non-trivial global Galois extensions. So, okay, so then, um, so then maybe you were saying, why did the speaker say a few minutes ago that it's time to wake up if you want to hear about connections to topology, since this sounds like there aren't any. Well, actually there are, there are. So what's going on is that, what's going on is that cohomology of moduli of formal modules do compute homotopy groups, but not in the way that Ravenel originally asked about. Let me explain that statement. Um, let me explain that statement a bit. There's this height shifting phenomenon going on. So here's a theorem. If you choose a formal A module over a finite field, and you look at its underlying formal group law. Among the automorphisms of the formal group law, some of them respect the complex multiplication. Some of them respect the extra structure of the formal A module. Some of them don't. So the automorphism group of the formal A module is a profinite subgroup of the automorphism group of the formal group law. Well, actually, it's a closed subgroup. And you can, it's not hard to show that. But you do, you do have to use uh, hard work other people did. You, you have to use the Nikolov Siegel theorem, which is something in profinite group theory. But in any case, you can, you can do it. It's not that bad. Uh, other people did the hard part, really. So, um, so consequently, since it's a closed subgroup, we can use this descent spectral sequence that Devonoff and Hopkins wrote about. Uh, you can take the cohomology of this profinite group with coefficients in the EN homology of X. Oh, well, that's the input for a spectral sequence that's going to compute those fixed points. And the idea is, well, what are those fixed points, really? Well, that's somewhere in between the Morava E theory of your spectrum X and this, just the K and local stable homotopy groups of X. So the larger the extension is, the easier the input is, is to compute. And in the, in the extreme case, when the degree of the field extension is actually equal to the height of your formal group law, your underlying formal group law, then the input is actually given automatically. It's, it's actually, it's, you can extract it from stuff that the number theorists did. It's, it's given by a local class field theory. Um, but, you know, the larger your extension is, the further the output is from the K and local stable homotopy groups. So what this is saying is this. The cohomology of a formal neighborhood of each point in the moduli stack of formal A modules, that's the input for an Adams or, or Adams-Novikov-like spectral sequence, which is computing the homotopy groups of some sphere-like thing. 
And I say sphere-like because if k in the base case where k is qp, you are computing the uh, k and local, uh, the, the, the homotopy groups of the k and localization of, of x. And so if x is the sphere, then, you know, then this is all very sphere-like. Um, and uh, let's see. Um, let's see. Ah, so a local at each height version of Ravenel's topological realization question. This does have a positive answer, even though the global at all heights version doesn't. So, um, so this stuff all has uh, some topological meaning, but it's all sort of local at each height. It doesn't paste together globally in, the, in, in exactly the way that you would like. But you can use it to deduce things about k and local stable stems, just one n at a time. So um, let me draw a picture that will maybe indicate kind of what's going on here. So, uh, so you know, there's this picture of the moduli stack of formal group laws, where, you know, with the stratification by height. And uh, I think I first picked up on, on drawing these pictures from Jack Marava when I, when I you know, studied with him in the late 2000s. And, he, he, and I, at one point I asked him something about, did you come up with these pictures? And, and he said, well, no, he's moved past that. Now he always draws. He has this Dante in picture that he draws with like the, the circles of hell. And I, I think that means he has great confidence that we'll, we'll never be able to do anything for height greater than nine, I guess. But uh, I don't know. But anyway, so uh, um, OK. So let me tell you what happens here. Let me tell you what happens. If you're, let, me, let me focus on the special case where the degree of your field extension is just two. You, you got a quadratic extension. Then here's what's going on in this map of stacks. The moduli theory of formal modules is exactly like the moduli theory for formal groups. It's so much the same. Same picture, except if I want to draw the picture compatibly with the map that you have here, which forgets the, the complex multiplication by A, the map does something interesting. It really sends the a height one point to the p height two point. And it sends the a height four point. Uh, am I saying this right? It sends the a height one point to the p height two point. And it sends the a height two point to the p height four point. It's, it's, uh, it's doubling all the degrees. This is what I've been calling height shifting. But you have the same stratification. And the picture looks like this. The picture looks like this. So, um, so what's going on is that, uh, what's going on is that this map works great just one height at a time. If you want to learn about height four stuff, like the height four cohomology of, uh, of you know, the, the, the Marava stabilizer group, well, then um, fine, that's great. But you don't look at the cohomology of the automorphism group of a height four formal module to do it. You look at the cohomology of the automorphism group of a height two formal module. That's the thing with a natural map. And that's going on behind the scenes in the algebra behind all this. That's the reason that Ravenel's topological realization question didn't have a positive answer. He was asking a global question, but the natural topology here is all very local at each height. That's what's really going on. And you can push this and do something. You can make really concrete computations with this. Now, I, you know, I, for the sake of time and for the sake of not going on lots of tangents and saying things that I've said in talks this year that a lot of you have already heard, I, I don't want to explain this whole second paragraph on this slide, but let me at least mention that it exists. Uh, you can really ramp this stuff up, and uh, there's a computational technique. If you want to read about it, it's in this long paper that I put on the archive last summer, cohomology, the height of stabilizer group. Um, there's a technique by which you can compute the cohomology of the height of stabilizer group, run a series of spectral sequences to extract the cohomology of the automorphism group of an A height N formal A module. So there, the height didn't increase. Height N stabilizer group, height N A module. And then from there, further spectral sequences, which take you to the cohomology of the height n times the degree of the field extension Bravo stabilizer group. So this process, this sequence of spectral sequences, starts with cohomology of height n stabilizer group, and it ends with a cohomology of the height n times the degree of field extension Bravo stabilizer group. So at large primes, prime 7 and greater, um, I actually did this for uh, n equals 2. Uh, I, and it was. The hardest thing I've ever done in my life, actually, it was, it's an extremely long computation. And much of it, but not all of the spectral sequences, are in that paper on the archive. So if you're interested, you can take a look. Uh, at the end, it, gets, it does get you to the K4 local V of 3. Uh, it gets, because the point is that the, uh, at large primes, the, the, the K4 local E4 atom spectral sequence there, there's no room for differentials. So the computation is just hard, hard algebra. And this, th these methods, these height shifting methods, let you do that hard, hard algebra. OK, great. So um, let me tell you some fun things that come out of uh, running this local at each height, the, the, the Devonauts-Hopkins descent spectral sequence that you get 
from taking advantage of this local at each height positive answer to Ravenel's topological realization question. Um, you run that spectral sequence, you, you exploit, you exploit the, the things that number theorists have proven about cohomology of formal modules uh, in the A height one case. You exploit the, the cohomological part of Lubin Tay theory. And you get that for quadratic extensions of QP and for primes greater than three, the continuous cohomology of this Galois group, the Galois group of the abelian closure of K over the maximal unramified abelian, uh, well, unramified implies abelian. So uh, co continuous cohomology of the profinite Galois group of the abelian closure of K over the unramified closure of K. Do that with mod P coefficients. That's isomorphic to this, this funny little thing. You start with the homotopy groups of the K and local Smith total V of one. You mod out by this little relation. So there I'm giving the, the made generators. And then you tensor it with a, a little exterior algebra on one generator, um, which is almost but not quite zeta two. Um, and that's what you get if k over qp is unramified. And, th and that's OK. So this, and this isomorphism is, is actually natural. Um, and in the ramified cases, uh, you get these two. Now actually, um, if p is odd, there are only three quadratic extensions of qp. There's one unramified and two, uh, two ramified extensions. And they're all of, you know, each of them is of these three forms. So this is actually a complete description of what goes on for quadratic extensions of qp. In each case, you get this funny little description of the, the uh, continuous cohomology of this great big uh, Galois group as a, a, a little quotient and maybe an extension by an uh, exterior algebra, but uh, basically a quotient of the homotopy groups of the K2 local uh, Smith total V of 1. So cute, interesting. I mean, that's, kind of, that's this, right? That's, that's, kind of, that's kind of this. That's going from cohomology of moduli of formal A modules to, well, haven't right told you special values yet. That starts actually on the next slide. But uh, something in number theory, at least, something interesting in number theory. There is a connection that, that's, that's coming out of uh, uh, Ravenel's question about topological realization. OK, great. Now let me tell you about special values. Now how am I on time? Five minutes? Is that about right? Seven minutes? OK, great. That sounds just about right. Uh, oh, yeah, I forgot that that joke was in there. So, I get, so you know, that's a joke. That's a joke. So I, I, I have this bad habit that I'm incapable of kicking, where whenever I give a talk, I, I write these slides, and I just put in everything I want to say. And then, I, you know, after an hour, I've said like 10% of them. And, and, you know, so that's it. I, that, hopefully that 10% has interesting things in it, you know? And, and uh, that doesn't always mean the talk is the best thing in the world, but it's a habit I can't kick. And uh, as a joke, um, I, uh, when I was preparing the slides for this talk today, I, uh, I um, I wrote this script that would make Beamer keep adding more and more pages to the PDF file to just inflate that number to some huge, huge thing. And, and it got so far that it actually, uh, when I tried to open the PDF file in my PDF viewer here a minute ago when I was setting up for the talk, it crashed my computer. So, um, so but 308 of the pages survive, but all but about 40 of them are blank. That's what happened there. That's what happened. All right. So. Uh, yeah, yeah, great. If, if, you're, if you're a bad speaker, you just have to run with it, you know? So, all right, so um, Ravenel on connections to special values. So, so finally, that's, that's the corner of number theory that, well, that's this corner of number theory. So, um, so uh, there is these natural relationships between number theory and stable homotopy groups of finite complexes, like smith tota complexes, that are established by following this thread of ideas that Ravenel laid out in that paper in, in 83 that I, you know, I, I really spent all my time thinking about that stuff. Um, so, uh, but there's more relationships that, that Ravenel pointed at between, you know, between this part of number theory and these computational questions. And here's what he said in the paper. This is all he said about special values in that paper. The numbers JM of, of a certain theorem, 3.8, uh, which is a statement of the global conjecture, those are also related to Bernoulli numbers and the values of the Riemann data function at negative integers. Now, but he's talking about the base case there, the case Adams talked about. And if you read Adams' J of X2 and J of X4, you've seen Adams' statements there. This is the f f famous description of MJ in terms of denominators of special values of the Riemann data function. And, uh, and Ravenel says these properties don't appear to generalize to other number fields. So for example, if you, if you, if you say, what's the natural generalization of the Riemann data function uh, for some other number field other than the rationals? How do you generalize that? Well, uh, OK, what's the Riemann zeta function, right? It's the P series from you know, freshman calculus. It's the sum for all n greater than or equal to 1 of 1 over n to the s. And this converges if the real part of, of s is greater than 1, analytic continuation, you know, blah, blah, blah. 
to, to, to generalize this to some extension of the rationals, this is the Dedekind zeta function of k. k is some extension of the rational numbers. And all it is is this. You take a sum over all the non-zero ideals, non-zero ideals i in the ring of integers of k, just take one over the number of elements in a mod that, uh, that non-zero ideal to the s. And you notice that if a is, the, is just the integers itself, in other words, if k is q, then, well, non-zero ideals in the integers are just, they're all printable. So, so, so this series is exactly that series. So, uh, so the natural thing, if you want a generalization of Adams' J of X4 result, the natural thing will be to say, okay, maybe special values of the Dedekind zeta function of a number field, maybe those denominators ought to tell you what's going on on the, the Novikov one line for formal A models. But Ravenel says, no, like, that can't be it, because if the, field, if the field's not totally real, its Dedekind zeta function just vanishes at negative integers. Now, that's true, but for totally real number fields, uh, what you get is, 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 is great and absolutely directly connected to number theory. It's non-zero, it's rational, and it's, and it's directly connected to, uh, I said number theory, but that's true. But more specifically, it's connected to algebraic K theory, which, as we know, is, is very much a part of uh, homotopy theory. So Lichtenbaum, in 1973, made this conjecture, and now we know that it's true due to the work of all these people. Uh, several major conjectures have to be proven to, to imply this. But if k over q is a totally real field extension, then the, now I'm, I have a typo here. Uh, there should be a k right there. This should be the Dedekind zeta function of your, of your field k, evaluated at 1 minus 2 times lowercase k. That's equal to the order of the 4k minus second algebraic k theory group of the ring of integers of k, divided by the order of the 4k minus first algebraic k, group, k theory group of the ring of integers. Now, it's not even obvious that those are finite, but they are. And so that's a rational number, and it's, it's a, whoops, and it's, so it's a rational number on each side of here, and they're equal up to a power of two and up to a sign. This is a wonderful theorem. Um, there are uh, higher generalizations of this uh, for non-totally real fields, where instead of just evaluating the Ded Dedekind zeta function, you look at the first non-vanishing Taylor coefficient. I'm going to blow right past that, because that's, that's, that's another subject entirely. But, um, but uh, using the proven you know, global conjecture uh, of Ravenel's, proven in, you know, in many cases, plus explicit computer calculation of these specialized of the Dedekind zeta function, um, the orders of, the, of these groups on the, the Novikov uh, uh, one line for formal A modules, uh, so far, and on all the, I've done, done a zillion computations of the computer, they, they agree up to a shift with the denominators of these special values. And I think I know how to prove it using, um, using Iwasawa theory, but I'm not ready to claim that yet. But maybe, maybe by the end of the year, I'll be giving talks where I say this is really true. I, but I, I think I know how to prove that always happens. Um, okay, so, so, uh, so Ravenel's pessimism uh, in, in his quote here about specialized, his pessimism, I, I, th I think he's right in the non-totally real case, but I think for totally real extensions of Q, you, you can really do this. Um, so, uh, so let's see. So, so, yeah, these kinds of orders of homotopy groups are specialized of L functions results. These suggested by Ravenel with some pessimism, these do exist, right, extending... Adams' J of X4 description of the homotopy groups of the KU local sphere in terms of denominators of the special values of the Riemann zeta function. These exist, uh, and they're useful, but this isn't a talk about these theorems, but I want to show you one example, uh, which, is, which is just, I just think this is great, and I think this is probably the example I'll give you and then end the talk. Um, um, th I think this is a great example of something that directly connects these in a way that's uh, special values and stable stems in a way that's really... Uh, I, I think this is great. So I, I really, uh, I, I think this is a door that when I opened, there were wonders behind it. I, I, I hope you, you like this too. Um, so here's a quick example. If P is an odd prime, then you can form this funny little product here. You take the Dedekind zeta function of K, where K is the unique subextension of Q would join a primitive P squared root of unity in which P ramifies totally. And I told you they had to construct the thing. It's just a fixed field of some simple little Galois group. But you take that number field k, it just has degree p over the rationals. You take that number field, you take its Dedekind zeta function, this thing here. You take that, and you divide it by the classical Riemann zeta function, this thing here. And you multiply it by one more little factor. That's, a, that's, a, that's the p local Euler factor. You have to kill that thing off. Um, uh, OK, so you multiply by that. And uh, then it turns out that when you evaluate that thing, uh, at, at n, right? You plug in, well, 1 minus n. When you, when you plug that in there, what I've written there, that turns out to be the order 
of the 2n minus first homotopy group of the KU local mod P Mohr spectrum. All right, fine. In fact, I, I haven't put that on the archive, but the paper doing that, I've sent it to some of you have it, but I, I should just put that on the archive. Anyway, um, the, uh, but, so now that implies something that I, I just, I think this is, I think this is a cool, I think this is very cool. So let me show you what this implies. Um, you know that in the homotopy groups of the K local mod P Mohr spectrum, the alpha family is visible there, right? It's visible in, in degrees, you know, two times P minus one, K minus one. You have, you have the whole, you know, alpha family showing up there. So there's an element of order P there for all positive K. So that tells you that when you, you know, so, so using this equality of this number with that order, that tells you that this, this quotient of these special values of zeta functions, that has a p in its denominator. This is some rational number, but there's a factor of p in the denominator for all positive k. Well, now there are these guys, Kubota and Leopold, who, uh, um, who define these p-adic zeta functions. Oh boy, I wonder if I want to uh, tell you a lot about these. What, I, what I'm going to do, given the time I have available, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to breeze through this real quick. And if you look at that and say, boy, I really want to understand that in more detail than this guy told me, then come ask me after it. I'll give you a lot more detail on this stuff, tell you exactly what these things are. Some of you probably already know these things, but anyway, I'm going to try and do it fast. Um, the kubota leopold uh, piatic zeta functions, the, the, the point is these agree with the classical Dedekind zeta function or Riemann zeta function at negative integers. They're designed to do that. So since you know that this thing has a p in the denominator for all positive k, that gives you, uh, that, that tells you that the, the piatic valuation of this rational number here is equal to the p-adic valuation of this rational number minus one. That's the p in the denominator, dropping the valuation by one. So you use p-adic continuity and discreteness of the valuation, and you get that that means when you take the limit as j goes to infinity of one minus p minus one p to the j plugged into these zeta functions, well, when you, in the limit, you know, p-adically, when you, as j goes to infinity, that converges to one. So, okay, great. So the p-adic valuation of this quotient of zeta, p-adic zeta functions, well, that's minus one. Now here's the reason that matters. Uh, the the the, the, Riem the p-adic Riemann zeta function that has a pole at one, and the fact that this valuation comes out to minus one that implies that this p-adic uh, Dedekind zeta function also has a pole at one. Now there's this guy Colmes, right? Pierre Colmes, who's this huge number theory guy, and his first paper was a p-adic class number formula, a p-adic uh, zeta function generalization of the classical class number formula from 19th century analytic number theory. Um, and it tells you that, uh, it tells you that the residue at one of this p-adic, uh, Dedekind zeta function is this nightmarish looking thing. But, you know, I explained here what each of these things are. And the point is each of these numbers here is incapable of being zero except for this funny one RP. I'm sorry I'm using this, this pointer so much. I think that's kind of annoying to, to, to watch. So I'm going to stop it. Um, RP. RP is the p-adic regulator of K over Q. You write down a definition of that, like Leopold did. It's the determinant of some nasty matrix of natural logs of p-adic numbers. I don't even want to touch that. But all I care about for, for, for the p-adic regulator right now is that Leopold conjectured that it's never zero. And the only way that that pole could be zero, in other words, the only way that that, uh, that, that uh, p-adic you know, zeta function could actually not have a pole um, um, I'm sorry, the only way that residue could be zero, in other words, the only way that that, that p-adic zeta function could have a pole at one, could, could fail to have a pole at one, that's what I mean to say, is if this p-adic regulator is zero. Okay, so now I'm stumbling over my words. No, try and let me say it more, let me say it more clearly. Um, what we showed on earlier slides, which is that this p-adic Dedekind zeta function has a pole at one, that implies, due to Colmes's class number formula, that implies that Colmes's class number formula couldn't, uh, that implies the p-adic regulator couldn't have been zero. Um, that, you know, if, if you have a pole, then this thing had to have been non-zero. Um, so the existence of the alpha family, which is what we use to show that this thing had a pole at one, that implies that Leopold's conjecture is true for this field, K, right? This subextension of Q would join a primitive P square through it. Uh, Leopold's conjecture is true for that field at P. So, okay, that's a, that's a good place to stop. So that's where I want to stop.